everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Worth Your Time Podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and today I'm talking with Sarah Butterfield. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, it is always awesome to talk to another Christian mom who wants to encourage other moms and Christian women. Um, And so when we found each other online, I knew that you were someone that I was really going to connect with. And so I'm excited to talk with you today. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and sort of what you do in the online space. Uh, Yes. So my husband and I live in San Diego here in California. We have two boys who are uh, eight and 10, actually almost nine and 10. And I am uh, an author and a speaker and a ministry leader. And so my first book is Around the Clock Mom, Make the Most of Your God-Given Time. And so I speak to different women's groups um, and I write a lot in the online space about making the most of our time and um, going deeper and connecting with God in this busy season of our lives. Yeah. I mean, I think as, I mean, I know not everyone that's listening is a mom, but many people are. And so that is probably the most common thing you hear is I'm just so busy and I'm overwhelmed. And, you know, I write about that a lot in my book that's coming up reason to return about how busyness is, is a reason that people stay away from church or, you know, are not investing in their faith lives. And so I think we're on the same track there. Um, And so how did you get passionate about this topic. I'm assuming you have some personal experience with it and then (laughs) decided you needed to teach people what you learned. Yes, I do. So, um, When we moved to San Diego, I had a 13 month old and I was very pregnant with the second and my husband took a job teaching at a local university and neither of us really anticipated how busy he was going to be. And I was in the middle of transitioning from being a full-time special education teacher to a full-time stay-at-home mom. And I did not really uh, have the support um, or the presence really. I had the support, but not the presence of my husband for the first three or four months that fall. And I felt like I was scrambling um, and really trying to figure out how do I meet my kids' needs and uh, my own needs? How do I carve out time for myself? And then you know that panicky feeling when you do carve out some kid-free time for yourself and you're like, oh my goodness, there's a million things I could do and I'm so excited and you're paralyzed with indecision. Yes. I felt like that so often. And so I just started thinking of like, what does it mean to be faithful stewards of the time that we have? And what is it? what does it mean to live well in this tension of wanting your kids to hurry up and grow up, but also um, enjoying the moments with them? Mm-hmm. And so that's how the book came about, which I wasn't really able to write until truthfully, the youngest went off to kindergarten. So- <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, how did you do that when your kids were small? Um, Oh, there's so much more I could dig into with that, but this is not a writing podcast. So I'm going to stick with, (laughs) I'm going to stick with our main topic here. Um, Okay. So I guess if you could give us some like sort of top line points um, on what, what kind of advice do you give women? I mean, we're entering probably a new year. I don't know if this is going to air before or after Christmas, but somewhere around there, we're entering the next year soon. Um, and a lot of times that's a time when people can go, okay, I want to change things. Like I want this year to be different than last year. And so what do you have to say to moms who are kind of feeling that way? And they're resonating with what you're saying right now. Um, well, the first thing I would recommend is to really, um, get, get honest um, about your limits and acknowledge your limits and your limits are not bad. They're not weaknesses. Um, but it's so good to just evaluate the season that you're in, make a list of your non-negotiable responsibilities, things that only you can take care of, make a list of those, acknowledge, um, acknowledge your very real limits, and then try to respect those limits and not over scheduling in, um, choosing to under schedule so you can slow down, um, treating rest, your own rest as not something to be earned, not a reward, but um, a right, a God-given right and something that we need to function well. So acknowledging our limits is a big one. The second thing that I struggle with too, even now, um, is to untangle our self-worth from our productivity. Mm. My husband asked me like, how was your day the other day? And my answer was, oh, it was so great. I got so much done. And those, those two statements are so linked and it's so hard to unlink them to realize actually my day can be great and I could have done nothing. And um, my belovedness in God's eyes is not tied to how many things I accomplished today 
or um, how many um, how many goals I have I have achieved in this time. And so that's a really a really helpful mindset shift that we can begin to make is to untangle that uh, your self worth from how much you're getting done. Okay, I really resonate with that one like so much because I agree what you just said. Like I had never thought of it that way, but yeah, a lot of times my my husband asks me how was your day, I will ex- exactly what you said. I'll be like, "Oh, it was so great. I was so productive. I got so much done." Like immediately, that's my answer. And a lot of times I have an emotional tie to my work and my productivity where I'm like, "Oh, if I didn't get a lot done, I kind of almost feel a little depressed about it." Yeah. And we really really need to untangle that. And so I think that requires, like you're saying, that requires like being intentional about the thoughts that we have around it. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and, and recognizing, yeah, recognizing that you, you do have worth and your day has worth, even if you don't do anything with it. Mm-hmm. Right. And we need that in moms, especially if you're a stay at home mom with little kids, Um, you really need to know that because sometimes you feel that you aren't getting anything done (laughs) at all, but you are being with your kids and that is a big something. So yes, it matters. That matters. Um, the other thing that is helpful is to forget about balance and doing it all. I feel like even if you're not a mom, we get this message all the time that women should, um, have it all and be doing it all at the same time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so we just pursue this idea of balance when maybe what we should be pursuing is priorities and making the hard decision of actually no in this season this is my priority and I'm going to let other things fall by the wayside and I'm going to trust that God will give me the time to do everything that I feel that he has called me to, right? Mm-hmm. But that is not necessarily all in one season. Right? Because Jesus's life, I mean, he didn't try to be, he didn't try to be a carpenter and do his, do, you know, the kingdom building work all in one, all in one go, right. He, he was a carpenter first. Um, and then, and then he saved his ministry for those, those special years. And, um, there's, there's wisdom in that. And I know every, everything around us says we need to be, you know, career women and wonderful moms and, you know, have this side hustle and um, have perfect marriages and also be like really great friends with, you know, our girlfriends, like have all these pieces when really we can acknowledge our limits and be like, I cannot be everything that I feel called to be in this season. Um, But here's the most important thing. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to organize my life so that I can be present for this most important thing in the season and trust that there will be time for other, other things later. This reminds me a lot of, I don't know if you have read this book. It's called the cost of control by Shannon Hottie Miller. Do you know her? No, I haven't. Yeah. It just reminds me of her. It's a, it's a pretty new book. I mean, I think it just recently came out. Um, but she just talks a lot about how, you know, we think we can, we think we're in control of all these things. Um, But really, especially with COVID, we kind of were shown like, no, you're actually not. And to think that you are is really not helpful to your personal life, not helpful to your faith. Um, And so, yeah, like admitting that we cannot do all those things, admitting that we are not in control, we can't keep all the balls spinning. um, That's a healthy mindset to have (laughs) because it's true. (laughs) Yeah. And there's real freedom there of saying, no, it's not my job to keep all these plates spinning. Right. Um, just the one maybe. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep one of them going. <laughs> well, I explain it as like, um, I, I use, use this example, a lot of pastor that I used to have, he would explain it this way. He's like, imagine you have a big vase jar that's bigger at the bottom and smaller at the top. He's like, you have to put your most important biggest pieces at the bottom. Um, you can't cram them in at the top. Like, so spiritual life, for example, like if you're putting, you know, your kids like elite soccer down at the very bottom and you're trying to cram your spiritual life into the very little top, that is not going to work out very well for you. And so we have to rearrange our lives. And so the things that matter most are grounding us, um, grounding the rest of our lives. Exactly. And and we don't like to hear that because we, that means we have to make a choice, right? We would rather do everything or try Mm -hmm. to do everything than have to cut something out. Right. Yeah. Um, I am like first person people are like, do you want to do a new book club? Do you want to do a new writing class? Do you, I'm like, yeah, yes, yes. I want to do all those things. And, um, 
you know, my, my husband will often tell me you're trying to do too much again. And I'm like, yeah, I am. I am. That is my personality and it is not good. So I totally am tracking with you here. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think has been so helpful for me, uh, but is still a work in progress because it's, it's constant is to view the interruptions in our day, wherever they're coming from, from our kids, from our coworkers, from, you know, whoever is around us to view those interruptions as, um, an invitation Mm -hmm. to minister to the people in front of us and to prioritize people over projects. Yes. Um, And so that is a mindset shift I am trying to cultivate, um, to take a one, especially with my kids, to take a deep breath at the interruption before responding, right? So they don't mm-hmm. feel like they're not valued, like like whatever I'm working on is more important than whatever they need or they want to tell me. Um, so I'm working on that. Yeah, it's, um, you can tell me if you have this experience. Sometimes your kid will go, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not as much when they're older, but they'll go, mom, you're like, uh-huh, mom, yes. <laughs> mom, mom. And then and they say mom like 10 times. And you're like, by the end, you're like, what? what? <laughs> Just what do you want to say? You know, you're like freaking out. Um, I think that's, I think that might be a universal mom thing. Um, but you're totally right. Taking a deep breath, um, before responding, that's such a good point. And then also, I love your thought there about, um, seeing interruptions as invitations because, um, there, and if you're familiar with Bob Goff, Yes. Yeah. So he, he talks in his book or on a podcast or something about how he like, he, he leaves space in his day for interruptions basically. Mm -hmm. Like, and if you don't have time for an inconvenience, um, then you don't have enough time. You're not making enough margin in your life because you need to be able to stop and help your neighbor or the person across the street. Um, and if you're so busy that you don't have time, you, you become the person that walks by um, the person that's in the ditch, like the good Samaritan story, um, that's a problem. And we are not meant to have every moment of our days and every moment of our life so full that we can't see the need around us. And, um, I think for Christians, that's such an important thing to remember. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so true. And I think that's a really good sign that you are overscheduled because you might be able, you might be thinking, yes, I have a lot going on, but I'm managing it. But if you, but if, if, if an interruption like that throws your whole day off course, that might be a sign that you need to, uh, say no to some things or start under scheduling and guarding, guarding your white space in your planner a little bit better. Yeah, definitely. Did you, do you have more tips or did we get through them? Those are my four, those okay. are my four main tips. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I do to your point too, about the, the vase and the the rocks that we put in the vase. And I, I, um, that really resonates with me. I hear so many women say, you know, I want to grow closer to God, or I want to grow deeper in my faith, but I just don't have time. And the, and the, 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 um, the truth is that, uh, if you value something, you will make time for it. And so yes. maybe the prayer, the prayer that we need is help me to want you God above everything else mm-hmm. and help me to want you. So I will make time for you and, um, cultivate the kind of faith habits, um, um, that I need to stay connected to, to God and to abide in God in this, in this season. And those, and those faith habits will look different for, for everybody, especially depending on season of life. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's a good reminder for people to remember that, um, you can like a prayer of, I want to want it is an okay prayer, or I want to believe, or, you know, it, it doesn't have, you don't have to, you're not supposed to wait to come to God until you're ready. Like yeah. you're supposed to come to God. Now he wants to meet you literally wherever you are. Um, and I also like to remind people that, um, a prayer does not have to be, um, a folded hands, um, on your knees, like super spiritual, like it can be in your head. Um, yeah. the other day I was reminding myself that, um, you know, cause sometimes I'll be like, Oh, I should pray more. But I'm like, actually, when you're thinking about this stuff and you're kind of like, just kind of going over it with God in your head, like that is prayer. Like you're mm-hmm. discounting that you are praying. You're li- you are talking to God when you're thinking about these things and what he wants you to do with them. And so, um, and, and the other thing I, I always say is a prayer can be one word. It can be help. Like it mm-hmm. just be like help. And, you know, the Bible says that, um, that the Holy spirit will intercede for us when we don't have words. 
And that can happen a lot, especially if you're really tired or you're overwhelmed or you're overtouched or you're just like, I don't want to pray. Like you can still just say that and, and it works. Um, so you talk, I know you talk some about boundaries. I know that's sort of a big topic right now. Lisa Turkhurst has a book out about it. Um, how do you make a boundary or like, what is, what is your sort of advice on creating those? Okay. Uh, yeah, boundaries are really important and boundaries are different than rules. Um, boundaries is something you set for yourself. Boundaries are what you are willing to do and what you are unwilling to do. So boundaries are not about controlling other people's mm -hmm. behavior. Yes. Um, yes. and you can, and you can, um, you, with your kids, you can set a boundary. Uh, my fa my famous example is when, uh, <laughs> when my oldest was very young, when he was just about 15, 16 months, I decided I did not want to become a mom stereotype and drink my coffee cold. I needed my yes. coffee hot in the morning yes. and he's such an early riser. I couldn't get up before him to drink my coffee before him. I just couldn't get up at four 30. He was up by five. Oh. And so what I decided to do was take care of all of his basic needs first. And then I told him when I'm holding my coffee mug, mommy is not available to play with you. And so there was pushback and I can't control if he's going to cry about that. And it took about a week of pushback for him to understand when I'm holding my mug, mommy can't play. And I would show him almost done, look inside, almost done. But sure enough, once he understood that I never had to drink my coffee cold. I never had to reheat my coffee, which I do right. not be reheating coffee. <laughs> and so, um, and so the boundary that I needed what was important to me was drinking my coffee hot. What you might need is sitting at the dinner table and not getting up 30 million times um, mm -hmm. for your kids or, or taking a shower uninterrupted. That might be the boundary that you need or whatever it is. Everybody has different needs, but you can say, okay, this is what I'm, I'm not willing to reheat my coffee or I'm not willing to get up from the table once I sit down. Um, and you can communicate that boundary in a loving way. You can't control how someone's going to react to your boundary. This goes, you know, with, right. uh, with friends and family members as well, but you can say, I'm sorry, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do. And that yeah. really helps, um, save your sanity. Right. Yeah. I think I, I mix that up way too much with my kids. Like I often am sort of accidentally turning it into a control thing and not remembering that it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. It, you know, when you're trying to do it as a control thing, you feel like you have more power, but you actually don't. Um, you kind of, you kind of give up power in a way with boundaries, but it, it works out better in your favor in the end. Um, even though it may be harder in the beginning to actually enforce it, but I think it's so key, you're right to understand what exactly a boundary means. And that definition is not like sort of brought back into the conversation enough. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit more about your first book and who would be the person you think um, would benefit from it. So around the clock mom is really geared for moms with kids that are very young. Um, it's the book that I wish I'd had um, when I was going through it. However, I have been very surprised by the number of homeschool moms um, that have older kids, kids in grade school um, that have gotten a lot out of it. And that's been um, really heartwarming to know that it's been helpful for that, for that demographic as well. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no. And that was it. That was it. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a copy? Can you hold it up? Or I do. Yeah, okay. here it is. Okay. Oh, cool. That's a cool cover. I like that. Yeah. Like the blue a lot. And um, you have, are you working on another book or do you want to talk about that or no? <laughs> yes. Yes. I am working on another book title, title to be revealed later. Um, but it is connected to this idea of how we most faithfully steward our time. Um, it is a book to equip and empower women to take seriously their theology and own their faith. I love uh, it. Yes. You know, that's that my alley. <laughs> yes. That matters. And time spent, uh, time spent with God is never time wasted. And, um, the theology that we have matters. It matters to the people around us. Women are leaders in their families, in their communities and in their churches. And so it's important that we, um, develop deeper roots of faith and know God more intimately because it matters to us and to the people around us. I think that is such a timely book. I actually, well, you, you might've seen, I was at a hope writers conference last weekend and, 
Um, and Mary DeMuth was talking about trends in the publishing industry. And she was saying that the themes around apologetics and things like that are really like rising, like to come, like they're not quite kind of here yet fully. And so I feel like you're right on time with that. And I know for me, um, learning theology and apologetics is something I had did not do up until a couple of years ago. And now that I have, I'm like, it's a travesty that I went my whole life without learning a lot of this stuff. Um, and I'm so committed now to teaching my kids, which I think your book will play into that because, um, as, as we teach our kids, we learn so much. And so our kids are going to be really a step ahead of us. And they, (laughs) and in today's world, let's be honest, they need to be a step ahead of where we were because it's not the same world as it was when we were kids. So, um, I love that topic. So see you're on my launch team now. So let me know so I can be on your launch team when your book comes out. (laughs) I will. I will. I love, I think we're all better together and supporting one another. Definitely. Okay. Sarah. Um, now I love to ask people, what is something you've been reading or that you would recommend, um, to the audience today? Oh, goodness. I'm sorry I didn't prepare you. Oh, no, that's okay. Anything that you've been reading is fine. Or if you're not reading right now, podcast, show, oh, no. whatever. <laughs> I'm always I'm always reading. Um, okay, so I just read this wonderful book called Freeing Jesus mm-hmm. by Diana Butler Bass. Okay. And she talks about um, different ways that we, that she is, so it's part memoir, part um, just general nonfiction about how we view Jesus throughout our lifetimes as friend, savior, teacher, Lord, and way and presence, I think. And it really, really blew my mind. And it, it was, it's one of those books where I am a better person of faith for having read it. So I highly recommend freeing Jesus. Okay. Um, And as far as fiction goes, oh, I have just, (laughs) I have so many, I love fiction. Um, I think the the one that comes to mind right now is the 100 years of Lenny and Margot. Oh, okay. There is a character in there. He's a priest and he is so endearing. And the way these characters um, interact together, uh, even though it's such a lighthearted book, it made me think deeply. And I love the kind of fiction that points me to a larger truth. And, and that's one of those books. Okay. Say that, say the title again. It's the 100 years of Lenny and Margot. That just sounds magical. I don't know. I like the sound of it a lot. Okay, cool. So you're a person that reads a nonfiction and a fiction at the same time. I I usually have about six or seven books I'm reading at at once. Yeah. That's how we are. That's how us writer people are. Like I can't stop myself. And do you buy a lot of books as well? I do. I do. It's becoming, it's becoming a problem. <laughs> it's it's a huge problem. I know my husband, like when we first were living together, he was like, you have to get rid of some of these. And so like ever, like once a year, I have to do a book dump, um, yes. which I hate doing because I don't really yes. want to get rid of any of them. Um, and I often just buy them. I like never go to the library. It's so bad. Um, and I just hate reading on Kindle. Like I just mm-hmm. can't do it, even though they're cheaper. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've got to have the hard copies. I love to underline. It's just, it's a huge, huge problem, but it's all right. It's all right. We're good. (laughs) Yeah. I am always pushing books I've read onto people. I'm I'm, like, you you have to read this. this. And people, and people are constantly like, how do you read so much? I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm number one, I'm a fast reader. Um, sometimes I probably read too fast and like I'm skimming a little bit, especially with nonfiction. Um, but it's just like, kind of like life to me. So I've got to do it. Absolutely. And it goes back to what we were saying before. If you love something, you make time for it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, well, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect? Um, the best way is to go to my website, which is Sarah K butterfield.com. And that's Sarah with an H. Um, and then I, I love sending out a twice a month newsletter with just curated links from around the internet that are going to help you in your journey of faith. Um, that's the best way to keep in touch with me. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us and I'm looking forward to your book. All right. Thank you.